So welcome to the April 7 meeting of the Kubernetes VMware user group. On today's agenda, we've got a number of items. Uh, and if we get through all those items as usual, we'll keep going and attempt to run a, this as generic Q&A and birds of a feather discussion covering things related to best practices for running Kubernetes on VMware infrastructure. The things on the agenda are recent updates in the CSI uh, storage driver for vSphere, as well as the cloud provider for running Kubernetes on vSphere. Uh, then after that, I added agenda items on a tech preview that's available for the VMware desktop hypervisor, if anybody is uh, willing to experiment with running Kubernetes on that. Uh, that tech preview supports the Apple M1 hardware. Um, and with that said, let's get into it. The uh, Let me post the link to the agenda notes document in the chat. If you'd like to, you can add your name to the attendees list in that shared document. And um, Let me just uh, share my screen to focus um, on the agenda. Okay, I assume everyone can see that agenda document and hopefully the font is appropriate so that it might actually be readable. So, on the topic of this uh, vSphere CSI storage driver, actually two months ago in February, this came up. So there was hints that, uh, and what we're talking about here, there were features added. The primary one I think is um, exporting metrics to Prometheus um, that relate to uh, success fail and performance of uh, storage operators operations when you're consuming vSphere storage uh, through Kubernetes. A uh, couple months ago, the stuff might have been in there, but it wasn't documented. And recently, meaning as recently as the last month or even the last two weeks, uh, the docs got published and a great blog post came out from Cormac Hogan, a member of the group who I don't think is here today, but um, he has specific instructions to walk through setting this up. Um, and by setting it up, I mean even hosting Prometheus and Grafana uh, to put together a complete uh, system with a GUI dashboard. Uh, I tried to walk through this myself, uh, but I just started it yesterday and was doing it part-time, so I didn't have didn't get far enough along that I can actually demo it, but Cormac's blog post has screenshots of what this looks like. Um, I will warn you, like I was trying to follow along with Cormac's and depending on your Kubernetes distribution, whether you use a commercial one, you know, an open source one or a community one, or uh, just use pure upstream code, roll it yourself, some of the instructions appear to be related to a particular distribution. So when it came to his instructions on identifying where some of these CSI components live, he called up using VMware-system-CSI as the namespace. And on mine, it turned out it was, I was using the Tanzu Community Edition that installs those CSI components in Cube system. But other than that, the stuff appeared to work as I went along. Um, Miles and I had a little sidebar chat before the meeting officially opened. So Miles, here's my question for you. You know, I was curious since I had run an installer to install Kubernetes as to what version of CSI actually was there. You know, I think that would be a common scenario where you use a commercial distribution or something with an installer and you're not really sure uh, what version of CSI you're dealing with. And I was curious as to what the best method is for determining that. You know, I poked around with a Google search and 
sad to say maybe there's room for improvement here because it didn't seem straightforward. No, you know, you're absolutely right. There, there is no easy way to tell, particularly in different Tanzu distros of Kubernetes. So for example, TKGS, which is what uh, Cormac was using, I believe for that. Um, or it could have been just vanilla with a straight up uh, install on it because it was uh, not a prepackaged uh, CSI driver. So when it comes to vSphere with Tanzu slash TKG service, that runs a private proprietary fork of the CSI driver, right? That's why they've got the quota mechanism and all that kind of stuff in there. So that is different and there's no sort of, you know, release number for that. So whatever you get in uh, the Tantu Kubernetes release for 1.21 is just what you get. You can't upgrade. It's not supported to upgrade. Um, it's a little different when you look at like TKG Multi-Cloud or TKGM, which you install the management cluster and then provision your other clusters from it. That's different because that does use upstream code. That does use upstream releases. Uh, and the best way that you would figure out what you're actually running in there is number one, it should say in the, the release notes. And if it doesn't, we should probably get product management to fix that. Uh, and number two is you can look at the image tags for those uh, pods themselves and figure out, you know, cause it will have the image tag in the, in the, the tag for the CSI driver itself. So that would probably be the other way. Um, when it comes to running the pure upstream stuff, like if you have a vanilla cluster that you built yourself and you installed CSI driver yourself, those images are tagged v2.1 or 2.5.1 or whatever dash and then the commit shell. Yeah, that makes sense. And I suppose if you installed it yourself, you'd already know. It's just that uh, you know some of these other distributions don't really give you the whole list of the bill of materials of what it is you're getting. And well, I'm, I'll say from like Google's perspective, like if you install Google Anthos, uh, GKE on-prem, uh, it uses a CSI driver, but they too forked the vanilla CSI driver and they do their own builds, which have their own uh, different tweaks here and there. They change some of the failover properties of certain pods and that kind of thing. So even if you go and say, look at Red Hat, or if you look at Google or whatever, Red Hat are still using upstream. I've heard that they're gonna fork and do their own thing as well, but it looks like what's happening is those distros are just saying, look, here's the package that you get with this release, live with it. Yeah. You know, you yeah, don't it, it, try and upgrade this stuff. It's a, I perfectly understand that, but you know, when it comes to the CSI driver publishing release notes with new features, I think it's natural for a user to expect that, hey, I want to know with, you know, my vendor chose this for me, but I'm curious as to what release I'm actually on in the event I want to enable, you know, Prometheus metrics. And I wish it were better. One thing I thought I might work was to just go look at the logs. I had this theory that, gee, if I can find uh, the pods where the CSI components live and go get the logs, um, I'll bet that they dumped the version when it started up, but it didn't appear that no, it doesn't. It did. No. That might be a nice feature to add. So maybe uh, I'll take an action item to to open an issue to suggest that because then even if somebody was to fork it, I doubt that they'd remove the uh, you know the choice the to strength. emit a version number to the log. So that yeah. might be a useful service for users. Uh, that said, you know, this is a recent version. So depending on when you installed your Kubernetes, where you got it from, you may or may not have these met metrics available, but I would guess that they'd be coming soon if they're not there already. Um, yeah. The metrics that I think are, you know, boiled to the top is useful. There are these success fail things. I think it's a three-way switch uh, that comes out on these various operations like volume, create, de delete, attach, et cetera. Um, so that, that would seem something useful to monitor. And then latency of these operations, you know, ideally these should be low, but if you go look at Cormac's blog, uh, he's got a Grafana dashboard that uh, shows these. So that strikes me as something really useful to have. And I think there are a few other things in there as well. Um, 
there is documentation uh, linked here uh, on collecting these metrics. To be honest, I have an inkling that there might be a few things in there. You know, if you were to look at the source that aren't disclosed in the documentation, or that was my Probably. impression as I was poking around. Um, so, but hey, some documentation is better than none, which is the state it was in a couple of months ago. So right. um, for whatever it's worth, um, this might be, I suspect this would be useful to very many people running this in a production scenario. It's almost, you know, if the metrics are there uh, and useful, it's almost crazy not to use them in my mind. Uh, could save you, you know, what, give you early what warnings. What kind of metrics is it giving, providing? So there, some of them are gauges. Some of them are like histogram type things. So you'll get like op types. So they'll be like, what part of the CRUD operation was it? Or, you know, is it a volume expansion? Or is this a query, you know, snapshot operation? So it'll give you the operation, uh, whether it passed or failed, that kind of stuff. Uh, the latency stuff, for example, that Steve was talking about is operation latency, not storage latency, critically, because they might look the same sometimes, but some operations, you know, take 50 milliseconds to process, some of them take three or four milliseconds to process, but each operation comes with its own latency, so you can monitor the API latency of the CNS CSI driver as well. Another thing I want to point out, this this picture that I scrolled up to shows kind of the basic architecture because some might not even be familiar with the terms used by Prometheus, but service monitors are the things that are put in place to gather this information. Uh, and they feed into a Prometheus server. Then you might put something on top of that like Grafana to actually render these metrics in a, a, a GUI so that you can get the dashboard experience. One thing that was pointed out by members of this group back when we covered this two months ago, I think it was Miles, Robert, and Scott, who I'm not sure has joined us today, uh, pointed out explicitly that in some distros, there might be a package of uh, Prometheus, but there's a particular version with an operator that is much easier to deal with than using some of the things like the packaging built into Tanzu distributions. So maybe one of you, Miles, or somebody wants to amplify on that, even though we covered this a couple months ago, I think it was sure. some, a, an important lesson to be learned. So if you install TKG extensions or Tanzu extensions or whatever they're called today on top of your Tanzu cluster, so that's like a bunch of out of the box uh, bits and pieces to help you, you know, get a baseline for running your case cluster. Uh, it uses KApp to install it all and, and that's fine. It gets you what you need. However, it doesn't include the Prometheus operator and the Prometheus operator is what gives you access to the service monitor CRD type, which you absolutely want to be using to discover all your metrics. So if you are using the Tanzu extensions, I, and you want to use service monitors, which you really should be using in prod for, for Prometheus, I would advise not to use the Prometheus and Grafana that comes with TKG extensions and instead use the Helm chart because it rolls all that stuff out. There's one called uh, Q Prometheus Stack, I think is the name of the Helm chart. I'll drop a link into the, the chat anyway. And that's the one that I would advise you guys uh, take a look at. If for some reason you really were attached to using the KApp thing, I understand there's a method to set that up, but it's manual using config maps. And uh, I've heard that it's quite difficult. So if you want not to pretty. Take, take the easy path, this, this operator method is uh, maybe going to save you some time and headaches. I dropped the chart into the uh, chat there. So that okay. is the one I encourage you to have a look at. The critical piece that it contains is the Prometheus operator. You could roll out the Prometheus operator yourself to your TKG cluster along with TKG extensions and probably make it work. Um, to me, it feels like a bit too much work to do something like that. And this is always known, tested, released as a package. So I would say uh, seriously look into Cube Prometheus stack. Okay, let me cut and paste that right into the notes doc. 
Well, I'll do it after the meeting. Since I'm sharing the screen. Okay, here's um, an advisory related to CSI and the upcoming 1.24 release. Now, just this morning, I saw an announcement that maybe this Kubernetes 1.24 release is going to be delayed. So, uh, you know, they, they had plans for a release candidate coming out very soon, like, you know, you know, this month in a week or so, but uh, they announced that re release candidate might be pushed back a little bit. And then 124 obviously is likely to get delayed too if the release candidate is late. But in any event, if you do upgrade, there is an advisory on CSI. This isn't just vSphere CSI, but I believe it's related to CSI in general of needing to drain out nodes in an upgrade scenario. And I put the link to the PR here that has more details on that. So, you know, if you live on the bleeding edge and jump on Kubernetes releases as soon as they come out, this is something you might want to keep in mind to not get ugly surprises. Um, then I'll turn this stage over to you, Miles, that the CSI now supports uh, CSI snapshot uh, natively. Yeah, so this is something that people have asked for for forever since we launched the CSI driver was CSI snapshot support. Um, I guess just some points of clarity. I mean, the, the high level thing is we now support the CSI snapshot feature, right? It's a boilerplate feature that's part of CSI spec, nothing special there. It does not back up your applications. It does not guarantee application consistency. It does not do any of that magic stuff. You still need to quiesce your app. You still need to make sure that it's consistent before you take your snapshots. These are not backups, um, but that functionality is there if you need it. So um, it does a snapshot at the vSphere layer, then it takes a consistent copy of the data and then it releases the snapshot of the vSphere layer. So you have a consistent copy of your data. Doesn't mean that the application was shut down and quiesced properly, but you will have a copy. And it could well be that whatever backup technology you use is prepared to integrate with this functionality in a CSI driver. But uh, right. yeah, that's outside the scope of what this group gets into. But you know, there are solutions like Valero, along with Restic, that might do some of these steps. And then there are packaged versions of commercial backup products too that may or may not uh, support this yet. Since it's new, I think that it's possible that some solutions are prepared to hook up to this yet, but I think that the roadmap would certainly be that I'd expect them to be to go down that path and take advantage of the stack of snapshot mechanism eventually. So as far as I understand, um because this is just the standard CSI snapshot uh, part of the CSI spec. Any backup app that you have today, take it Valero or Kasten or whatever it is that you use to do your cloud native backups, if they support CSI snapshot and that part of the spec, it should just work with this. You know, it's there should be no proprietary integration needed to, to support this feature. Like Steve said, it's brand new. There might be bugs, it could be broken, we'll find out, but it should just work with your, those backup tools. It works with Cast N, Portworks, and Valero, by the way. I've tried all three in the lab. There oh, great. Go. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Haven't tried it with Dell's one, but I tried it with all three of those and it works and Dell's uses Valero. So I guess that yep. should work as well. Power, power back, power something, isn't it? Power protect, power some protect container, it. something. It's like seven words, but yeah. Yep. To say we put a UI around uh, Valero, but yeah. So Miles, do you want to cover the stretch cluster too? Uh, yeah, so um, we've talked about this at length in, in other meetings and other forums about should you do stretch cluster with Kubernetes? And my personal opinion is absolutely not. Um, though we do have a lot of customers that keep asking it, asking us for it anyway. So the Maybe CSI driver- Maybe even give us a background for 
dummies who don't know like me who don't know what a stretch cluster is or <laughs> sure that's that's a good starting point let's do that so a stretch cluster is whenever you have two compute clusters on different sites or different buildings or whatever uh, and you have a single storage array or what appears as a single storage array it's you know a single logical storage array but backed by two physical devices and they synchronously replicate to each other that means every io operation is completely blocking so if there's a vm on site a and it writes to the data store on site a it does not get an acknowledgement back that okay that was written until it goes to the other side gets an act that comes back and then they both act to say that was a successful transaction so that's synchronous replication and a stretch cluster essentially does that but across multiple sites so uh it was a a way for years and years and years to protect applications that had no ability to shard or spread or replicate data themselves so think about your microsoft sql server that's a bad example it does have that uh, let's say MySQL as an example, or you know any of those more traditional type databases, uh, they don't have built-in replication or sharding or the ability to scale out or anything like that. So you would protect them with a stretch cluster. So if your entire site dies, no problem, all your data lives on the second site and your workloads come up. Uh, this poses a lot of problems for Kubernetes because Kubernetes was designed to not come back from those kinds of failures. It was essentially designed that if something dies, it stays dead. You know, it isn't recovered somewhere else. And that does cause some challenges. And particularly from like a failure domain architecture point of view, it is very, very challenging to try and align uh, Kubernetes failure domains. So say you have three nodes, stretch clusters are almost exclusively two sites. So you have a system, Kubernetes, that needs three nodes for quorum and you only have two physical sites. That means one of those sites is gonna run two copies. So that means you're in a 50-50 crapshoot every single time of, if there's a failure, it might take down the cluster, it might not take down the cluster. And then whenever it does fail over, there's a whole bunch of complexity about, well, the nodes thought they were over here, now they're over here, and your applications, you know, sort of separation logic inside Kubernetes, be it anti-affinity policies or whatever, now no longer applies because the, the underlying topology has changed based on what Kubernetes thought it was. So there are reasons why some companies want to use stretch cluster. That is essentially, this is the way we've always done things or the only cluster we have is a stretch cluster. Please tell us we can just run it there and we'll pin it to one site or something like that. Um, but it is not an architecture that you should go into thinking this is the best way to run Kubernetes. This is the best way to make everything redundant because it will just cause you headaches and a lot of pain going down the road. Uh, that said, the CSI driver now supports it. And this is essentially just a sign off that says, yes, we will support you if you run it on a stretch cluster, but we're not recommending that you run it on a stretch cluster. This is specifically for those environments where you have essentially no choice but to run it on a stretch cluster because that's all that you have in your organization. So there was no, there was nothing technically that changed that. Uh... No, it was validation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it works the same way it's always worked. They did add some extra test cases. And I believe there was like one or two edge cases that they caught. So there might've been a few really niche things that they fixed, but the larger work was validating it, figuring out how we support it from a GSS perspective, figuring out how engineering supports it uh it was mainly validation yeah and i suppose you know the the one thing to consider then since it's not recommended but if you had kind of these legacy style databases running your option would probably be to just run them outside of kubernetes entirely and 100%. they should work perfectly fine the way they have for a decade or more and uh you'd be able to take advantage of this uh, stretch cluster that you already invested in and get the high availability that you invested in. Precisely. Yeah. Don't, don't add a layer of complexity that you don't need. If you don't need to put your existing database on Kubernetes, don't do it. If it runs fine in VMs and you've got it protected by a stretch cluster and it works, leave it alone, build your new stuff in Kates and leave the old stuff where it is until you decide 
we're going to replatform into a completely different database and it's going to be a real cloud native database. Sorry, my dog just saw someone outside. Okay, thanks, Miles, for covering that. Um, another update the a number of cloud provider new versions came out in the last couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, the latest version, the 1.2.6, but they backfilled some bug fixes um, and I don't know, maybe even some feature enhancements on some of the older versions as well. Um, you know, we, we support those because sometimes distributions or users are running on something less than the very latest release so that, uh, you know, it, it, it can be important to support uh, users who are on things going back a few versions. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to read you the list here. One thing is uh, the Helm chart moved. So a Helm chart is the recommended way for installing the vSphere cloud provider if you're running the route of pure open source or if you're in the position where you actually publish a distribution or installer of Kubernetes yourself. So I think it's previously been public published in a chart location that was declared deprecated a few years ago, but now find it in the new improved location. Um, and it fixed a few bugs related to these UUIDs being flaky under some scenarios. Um, so moving I, on. I got a question on that. <clears throat> yeah. So like we're in the case that you mentioned where we still have older versions of other things that have blocked us from migrating to the CSI. Um, one of the things we found was that the vSphere API can cause basically the kubelet to not fully start up. <clears throat> um, do you, and uh, actually one of the things we've seen was the UUIDs changing and then that, that preventing that causing some issues, but it looks like maybe that might be some of the fixes here. Um, but that, yeah, for... at the tip of my tongue, I'm not all that familiar that they linked, I think two or three uh, issues or bug reports that have been fixed. So the details should be in there. If you've been having this issue yourself, hopefully it aligns with one of these open issues. Otherwise you should open a new one. Uh, obviously, and we can work with you on getting to the bottom of that. Yeah, we've, I, we have an issue open internally with VMware, our VMware support on uh, the vSphere API basically needing to get restarted um, uh -huh. anyways. But when that was happening, we were experiencing impact on the clusters if Kubelet restarted during that time because it would try to connect to the vSphere API, it wasn't available, and it would get stuck in a state where it couldn't mm. finish starting up. Is that <clears throat> entry cloud provider pricing? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's not surprising. That wouldn't obviously exist. So if, I, I was if gonna ask, does that, CTI? does that change if, if you're on CSI? As far as I'm aware, if you're on CPI and David's on the call, so maybe he can confirm here as well. But um, if you're using CPI, it's not integrally part of Kubelet anymore. So Kubelet should be able to start up without CPI establishing a connection to the vSphere API because it's an external component. That's true. I have a cluster that was up when my vCenter, like that nodes crashed and came back up and my vCenter was not accessible. It's, you know, not 100% necessarily functional. And Kubelet is up and everything is running. You've got other issues from provider node refs and things like that, you know, but uh, the cluster will come back up. The nodes Kubelet is not, it's not in the data path anymore, the access to the cloud. Okay. Right. It exactly. was it was a little mysterious because Kubelet would be it would look like it was up, and it would start reporting to the uh, API server, and then it would just stop. It was mm -hmm. it was like it partially got up, and then it hit that that spot 
where it was trying to make that connection and then just stopped. Um, but it still kind of looked like it was up, just wasn't ever communicating back to the uh, the Kubernetes API server after that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean the 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 entry cloud provider we knew we know has a lot of issues, right? It was a prototype thing that we put out years and years ago, and that's that's why we built CPI and CSI was to get to get away from a lot of those inherited problems that that the, the vSphere cloud provider had. Um, but I would say a lot of those kind of like weird niche, especially there's stuff to do with like disk failures and uh, failures to mount in particular happens pseudo regularly with the vSphere cloud provider. And if you're on CPI, CSI, I haven't heard of those problems in, in a very long time with those components. Yeah, and the Kubernetes project itself, they keep kicking this can down the road, but they keep, you know, for two years now, it's been one year from now, we're gonna kick the entries out of the tree and the, you, you will be forced to migrate. The reality is they, I, I, I think are maybe exaggerating the speed at which that's going to happen to encourage people to actually, you know, human nature is that some places will just sit around until the deadline is on a horizon that forces them to move. Uh, but it's been going on for several years now. So if I were on the entry, I think it's time to maybe be scared and, you know, well, even we're looking, it costs resources. I mean, we're looking to get over. We just still have <clears throat> some some hardware that can't move, Yeah, right? Uh, is the it because your can't... hardware is pre-7.0? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you've got uh -huh. some hardware that can't get moved to that. So we're, we've... We're looking at, I'm like, okay, are we going to separate those off and do something different with those um, because of what the hardware is? But anyway, so we're getting close to be able to start testing that. We could move some of our environment, but then it gets confusing when you're like, okay, half our environment's like this, half it's like that. So it's almost easier to just wait till you can get everything. But um, when it, these versions that's called out in that note, is that the Kubernetes version? So that version, uh, these align with the version of Kubernetes that that cloud provider supports, but I believe they will support older ones than that and not newer ones. So there is some correlation where these semantic versions do track, but it isn't necessarily a one for one. So I guess my, my question is, uh, if I'm talking about just the entry provider, I'm getting those updates like that it would say here if I'm getting to that version uh -huh. of Kubernetes. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. If you're, if using... you're, yeah. If you're on the vSphere, if you're on the integrated vSphere cloud provider, the entry one, yeah, mm -hmm. you obviously only get updates when you do a distro update, a kubelet update, because it's part of that bin. So yeah, it would be whatever is in those. Okay. Yeah, the CPI in general is the major and minor version has to match with the Kubernetes version. So any 120 needs to be with a 120 CPI, but it could be any 120 will work with any 120 of the CPI is kind of the general contract that is made. Um, beyond that, 121, same thing, 122, the same thing, but you can't use a 121 with 120. Um, there is a contract about that just in terms of breaking changes. Doesn't mean it won't work, um, but with the changes of Go versions and things being vendored in and different Kubernetes things being vendored in, uh, it's the supported way is to be in the same release, same yeah. minor release. <clears throat> so that next bullet or the last bullet point you see there, so it says uh, vSphere CSI and, and now has no dependency on CPI. Um, yeah, what that means is that if you elect not to even use the VMware written cloud provider, you can still use the vSphere storage uh, uh, plugin. Um, I'm not sure what the scenario would be that that would take place, but apparently there is one uh, because they've called it out. Yeah, it's... Um... That's an interesting one. It's, I'll be honest, an internal engineering decision. Um, the engineering team behind CSI wanted to essentially 
allow the CSI to work without any dependency on the CPI. And the only thing that it's ever depended on CPI for was to populate the um, node UUID, uh, which CSI has now moved away from. They use a different method instead of node UUID to actually do storage alignment with the, the node that it's in. So there is no type coupling between the two anymore. If you just want to run the vSphere CSI driver, you can do that. There's no external dependencies. Okay, moving on then, unless somebody has comments to add about the cloud provider or CSI, go for it now. So Miles, you don't need any CPI or it's not tied to vSphere CPI? You don't need the vSphere CPI. Uh, now, as I understand it from a Kate's perspective, you either need to choose an in-cloud or in-tree uh, provider as part of Kubelet Bootstrap or choose external. I don't know if there's like a dummy external that you could use, um, but you don't need the vSphere CPI to be present anymore to use CSI. That's, that's the top line, but I don't know what other way you would do that because I haven't tested it. Use the KubeVip cloud provider. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, that would Again. work. And you would have a load balancer too. Exactly. Yep. Lower by one pod. Why not? Perfect. Yep, do it. Of course, when it comes to KubeVip, you can use both the vSphere and the KubeVip cloud provider at the same time because they don't overlap since the vSphere one doesn't attempt to do load balancing. So mm, although true. it does have load balancing capabilities now with uh, NSX, it can do NSX load balancing yeah. for you if you have NSXT. Yeah, I guess that you have the option to turn it on if you want. Right, and then you cannot have KubeVip, but that's only if you enable that in the vSphere CPI at which point there's no reason you would want KubeVip. <laughs> I was going to say, now I'm going to have to go look up KubeVip because I haven't ever looked at that. That's not a project of ours, Bryson. It's a, it's a community one, but it's really quite nice. Think of it as like the spiritual successor to MetLLB, but like really maintained, done well. It's a really nice piece. And if you do go there, it's a little dated now, but Bryson, I, we actually had Dan... Finneran come and present to the group middle of last year, I think. And it was a great presentation and it is posted up on YouTube. Um, I think Dan has had some other, perhaps more recent talks on it in other venues. Um, I can't remember if it was a KubeCon or a, a, a Cloud Rejects or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm really a fan of it myself and run it in my home lab. Uh, it, I don't know that it would hold up in an enterprise, large scale enterprise scenario as a load balancer, but certainly for home lab and maybe for edge, um, that thing, I think it, it is pretty attractive. Actually, I did have a question. What about the zoning stuff in the CPI? Does the CSI driver now take over that functionality or? So that's a good question, David. So it it has it, it's got its own implementations of zones and regions as well. Um, as far as I understand, it's never actually used the CPI for zones and regions, and they've always done their own zones and regions. Uh, I think it ignored the stuff that the CPI put in there. I might be wrong, but that's just what I recall from the last time I, I talked to engineering about it. Yeah. So then, well, like someone like Kubernetes, like you know, starts to do like, you know, node and re like zone placement and stuff like that. Does it take the, you know, take the side of like hey, I'm going to look at the CSI stuff or the C or you know, if CPI is up and running. You know, which one is the one that kind of wins out because there's only, you know, there's only one, well, two labels, right, that actually determine where that happens. So if you have both running, will they conflict or? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but like you they say, don't. it is a very simple mechanism. So they don't First conflict guy. with one. They don't conflict with one another. One is for pod scheduling and the other is for persistent volume scheduling. They're used for different things. The CSIs will not deal with pod scheduling onto nodes. The CSI will purely do zone topologies for where 
to create the persistent volume. Um, that's it's purely zoning for persistent storage, not for the pods. So if you want to have full availability zone topology aware, you're going to need the CPI uh, in order to be able to get topology awareness in pod scheduling onto nodes. Yeah, it seems a little it's interesting because like if you use there's like a whole other mechanism to do like volume scheduling somewhere. It would make sense that you would want the pod to land in a place where it you could actually access that volume. It, it's yeah, that's why I brought up the question. Yeah. I was just interested in yeah. how they would resolve that. <laughs> the only way of really solving that without the CPI is I mean you can set in volumes if you have the provision before schedule, or I forgot the names, but there's provision the disk before creating the pod or schedule the pod and then create it. Uh there's different. Uh, settings you can do with that. So you could probably play with the ordering. Um, yeah, so wait for first consumer for first consumer. And, you know, you could probably play with that and maybe get away without the CPI. Um, but yeah, it, it seems I'm, pretty niche to me why you would not want to run the CPI with the CSI. I mean, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I mean, sure, if you're not doing multi zone, maybe you could get away with it. But I mean, yeah. realistically, just run the CPI and the CSI. I think the only case that I see that is that in the docs you mentioned there, uh, there's something here about for the adventurous who want to try Kubernetes on a VM and ARM based things. Um, if you try things on like ESXi on ARM um, or on laptops running vSphere, you know, whatever, you may be a bit more constrained in resources and the CPI does take quite a lot of resources relatively. Um, so it's just getting rid of another uh, pod from there. So I think for edge cases, there may be a use case for that, but that's not going to be topology aware. So probably shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I think this whole topic of zone awareness and reaction, you know, where potentially you've got infrastructure failure domains as a lower layer to Kubernetes failure domains. And we've had chats about this before. It's by necessity complex if you're not going to be opinionated and force people to particular choices, which the VMware infrastructure tends not to do. You know, you could uh, elect to have a data center that has redundancy by rack, by aisle, by region, and it's all out there if you want to do it, but it makes it hard to put a canned solution that just works out of the box without configuration settings. Anyway, um, let's let's move on unless somebody has. I have, I have one more question on the yeah. CSI stuff. Uh, I read somewhere that there was a minimum hardware version of 15. Is is that true for every like for all the CSI stuff or? Yeah, it's for all the nodes that are going to use CSI. So any Kate's node has a minimum requirement minimum requirement of V15. I've been asked this a lot in the past, you know, can it be used with a lower hardware version? And people say, hey, I got it to run with hardware, VM hardware 13. You can get it to work with 13, but there are some nasty bugs and edge cases that are resolved in V15, particularly around failure, failures and disk remounting that you do not want to get involved with. So if you try it out and you see that it does work on 13, yes, it will work. But you, once you get into some failure scenarios, it's going to be kind of hairy. So we would definitely say we recommend and we only support V15. So please try and stick with V15. OK. Just double checking on that. Yeah, I know it's a bit of a pain in the ass to have well, to I mean, that makes sense for because it says for the so the I think the question comes in it does say that it supports vSphere 67 like u3 or something yes 6.7 u3 is the first one yeah so then you're looking at like maybe a hardware 14 or something right, right. um but there 
and because that was the first release, uh, we didn't realize that there were these bugs at the time in the first release that we discovered after the fact, which is why we retrospectively said V15 is where you need to be. Uh, but as far as I know, V6.7 uh, U3 does support VM hardware 15. It, it definitely should actually, because if we made that the requirement, it should be lined up with the ESXi version. I can check real quick. Because I think I were, we were looking at that and it looked like we couldn't go to 15 because of these for six, seven. Oh, okay. But yeah, if you could double check on that, if like, if that is supported on six, seven, then that would. I just Googled it and I find my own blog on it. Um, so it says in my own blog that the requirement is B, 13 for 6.7 U3. So let me just check internally. It might have been 6.7 U3 and the first version of the CSI, we said 13 because that was you know what we originally tested on. And then for the newer stuff, once we went to 7.0 and revved it a bit, then we decided that 15 was the minimum that we were going to support from that point on. I'll check internally here and I'll, I'll let you know. The issues may have also been with the new functionality that was added into vSphere 7, like resizing and things like that may have caused the issues that required 15. Uh, as far as I remember, the actual issue was to do with persistent IDs for the disks. In v13, that doesn't exist as a feature as part of VM hardware, and we don't retrospectively port features into VM hardware. So we rev the version, and we added the ability to have persistent IDs for disks in 15. So to I, as I've always remembered it as a bug fix and not a feature thing, but I, I might be misre misremembering. Uh, that disk enable UUID thing that you have that's, to set? That's, that's the one. Yeah, disk that enable UUID that you have to set in the VMX for every single virtual machine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, VM hardware for 15 is from 6.7 U2. Perfect. So uh, uh, if you're if you're on U3, you, you should be good. Can you? Oh, is that the? That's the link Steve chucked in the chat there. Where was that in there? So I can just grab it. Uh, it's not coming up. For me. It's in it's in Zoom chat. I I sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to pull. I'm pulling it up. It's taking forever to load. Hang okay. On. So I where did it throw it? It said hardware fifteen six seven u two. Okay. Yeah. So you should be good. And that has told me that I need to go back and update my blog that I found. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll move on again. Somebody a few minutes back mentioned running ARM. This is a different form of ARM. So there is a new update to, or a tech preview. Tech preview meaning that it's, you know, Potentially, it's not for production, it's experimental. We're looking for feedback from users of the desktop hypervisor for Mac, Fusion. And it does support the recent Apple M1 hardware. Um, so relevance to this group, uh, you know, we declare that we cover all the VMware hypervisors and some people might be trying to run Minikube or some other form of Kubernetes on a, on a laptop. So I've put a link in the agenda notes document and here I'll cut and paste it to the chat too, since I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but you can go enroll in that tech preview and get a download of that and play around with it. Um, I don't run a Mac myself, but I took a look at it this morning and does look like there might be some bug reports and things there. So, you know, like all tech previews, this is for the more adventuresome. Um, finally, another note, and this might relate to David's comment about zoning, because I think we'll get into some coverage here, but the KubeCon Europe conference is coming up in May, I think third week. Uh, and this group has a maintainer track session there. So Michael Gash will be presenting there on the um, 
eventing uh, integration with Kubernetes. And if you'll recall about a year ago, Michael, along with William Lamb, gave a presentation to this group about their fling that um, uses event-driven programming to monitor things going on in the VMware infrastructure. And then potentially you can write apps that would cause your Kubernetes to react to changes there. So I know some of the things that they covered a year ago were related to zoning where you could potentially have events occur over in your vSphere, either due to failures, eminent failures, or even somebody manually reconfiguring something that you would want to uh, react to with your Kubernetes deployment installed on top of it. And there was there were mechanisms so that you could use it like that, or you could simply use it maybe more along the lines of event notifications being used as troubleshooting tools, early warnings, things like that, of things that were going on down at your infrastructure level that could be combined with events being generated from your Kubernetes level and provide a, a unified way to keep those things together for troubleshooting. So anyway, that session is occurring in about a month. I think it will be good. That said, I'm, I'm co-presenting with Michael and we don't have the deck done yet. So potentially if you've got any requests for things to be covered, I can't promise we'll get them in there, but maybe. And uh, I would anticipate that would be an update on this presentation that William and Michael did about a year ago. Also, that KubeCon conference is anticipated to be physical. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, the COVID news seems to change week by week, month by month. But back in the pre-COVID days, I, would, I know we were hoping along with Robert when that KubeCon was destined to be in Amsterdam to actually have a physical meeting of group members. And for now, anyway, I'm planning on attending physically. I think, David, you might be attending physically as well. So, But if we can get a quorum, even if it's not an official event, maybe we can have a get together <laughs> while we're there. Yeah, for sure, I'll, I'll be coming oh, to keep going. Yeah, I'm trying to go. I'm just still waiting a, a funding approval which is very annoying, but oh well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same uh, same here. Okay, well, great. Let's make that a tentative plan then because uh, it's been a while since we've had that face-to-face -face experience and uh, I'd look forward to it anyway. Um, if the group is four, I think I can get away with uh, buying, buying uh, beverages and maybe a little food. So we'll see what happens. So we've covered our agenda. Uh, that, that was the last item on the agenda in the notes document, but we've still got five more minutes if anybody has anything they want to bring up, either to talk about now or to nominate as a topic for next month. Okay, if nobody's got anything, I've got nothing against ending this meeting a couple minutes early. So last call. Okay, thanks everybody for attending. If anything comes up late that you wish you had brought up, uh, go for it in the Slack channel. Um, and otherwise we'll see you in a month. Maybe some of you will see also at KubeCon Europe. Uh, bye. <laughs>